Was I the only one edified or encouraged by those songs? I didn't think I was. Isn't that amazing? Especially the one we just sang. 642 is a direct quote from Psalm 23. And no offense to the writers of these songs in these songs books, but they're not as good a writer as the Holy Spirit. And to sing a song like that, it's strengthening to me. I don't know if it is to you, but it's strengthening. Not some direct operation foolishness. Not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those words echoing in my mind. That is strengthening and encouraging to me. It isn't a faltering, uh, dithering, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can do it or not. Of course we can do it. Of course we can do it. Yea, though I walk through death's dark veil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I may fear a little evil. No, I shall fear no evil, right? So it's encouraging. And, and I appreciate your participation in that. I, I needed that. Acts chapter 4, verse number 26 is where we are tonight. The book of Acts is a slightly different book than many of the books we've studied. The book of Acts is an inspired document, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is God-breathed. If you want encouragement, if you want edification, you won't find it from the whims of men. You won't find it in their doctrines and their messages. If you want encouragement and edification, you'll find it in God's Word. It is able to build us up, Acts 20, verse 28. The book of Acts is no exception. The book of Acts is an inspired document written by Luke. The words actually given to Luke by God himself. And it chronicle the events of the inception and the, and the life of the church for the first 30 years. Acts chapter 1, we said, has a time reference similar to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the very final chapters. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. As a matter of fact, if you read Acts 1 through 8, you'll see very similar details that Luke gave in his own epistle in Luke 24 beginning in verse 46 through verse 49 you'll see very interesting similar words used power is used there uh, similar words are, are used to emphasize this so the time frame of Acts 1 verses 1 through 8 we, we always say is basically synonymous with the great commission those 40 days right verse 9 through 11 of Acts 1 Jesus ascends to the Father, and as He ascends to the Father, He is given that throne and dominion and glory. He is sitting upon His, uh, his throne. Uh, he is, Hebrews 8, He has sat down on the right hand of God. He has done His job as Redeemer, and He is now at that position of power, that position of authority. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a few minutes as it relates to that position of authority because we're going to understand something. We're going to go back and we're going to look at Psalm 2 once again because that's where we find ourselves uh, as uh, the, the men began to quote that in the prior verse. And we're going to look at that. Number one, Jesus reigns. And number two, there will always be opposition to that reign. Always. As long as this earth stands, there will be opposition to it. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2 is the fulfillment of uh, God's promise through His Son to the men that were with Him, John 14. He would send a comforter to them. The comforter would reveal all truth, John 14, 26. It would, uh, he would teach them all things, John 16, 13. This is how uh, a, an inspired gospel would be revealed. And it is how an inspired gospel would be confirmed by the power given. Acts chapter 2, you can see that Peter begins his sermon. And he, he relates that this is that, verse 16. This is that, what they hear... That is, the tongues is what Joel spoke of in Joel 2, beginning in verse 28. And this outpouring of power, this time in which there would be an outpouring of or from God's Spirit upon men and women. And it would be uh, not just a, well, there's a prophet way over here in Samaria and there's one way over here in Jerusalem. No, this would be a time in which there would be more widespread spiritual gifts given for the revelation and confirmation of truth. And Peter says, this is that, the outpouring of this gift. Keep in mind that context, this is that, as he relates to the gift or the promise, excuse me, of Acts 1, 8, the promise of Acts 2. And this being the miraculous gifts. Acts 2 and verse 21, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not a prayer. 
It isn't saying whosoever prays to God will be, will be saved. Paul says it in Romans 10, 13. He quotes it also. He quotes Joel verse, number thir, uh, chapter 2 and verse 32. Making application to gospel obedience. Paul would say in the very same chapter, Romans 10 and verses 1 through 4, that his heart's desire was for his nation to be saved, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all that believe. And if they would simply surrender themselves to the authority of Christ in obedience to the gospel, they could be saved. So don't tell me Acts, uh, Romans 10, 13 means something other than what Paul says in the first four verses of that chapter. Or the entire concept of the book of Romans, which is the obedience of faith, is the means by which man is saved. Gospel obedience. What Peter says in Acts 2.21, quoting from Joel 2.32, he iterates further and supplements, gives further information in verse number 38. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. To call on the name of the Lord is to invoke God's authority to, to save me by doing what God says. That's easy. It's not difficult. Chapter 3, the church goes forth. They go to the Jew first, right? Romans 1.16. And they face persecution immediately. So Acts 3, the church goes forth. Acts 4, the church persecuted. Acts 3 and 4 should be understood as being, uh, uh, as being no separation between the two. The, the sermon that Peter preaches in Acts 3, Acts 4 is a result of that very sermon. And it's at the same time frame and it's the same individuals who hear this that are now persecuting them. And they even have the man present that they healed. Right? So we're, we're talking about the same time frame. Verses 23 and 24. Peter and his brethren have been let go from their imprisonment and have now related the warning from the Jews to their brethren. And as they with one accord, they, uh, they uh, utter this prayer to God. And they quote Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. So that, that quote begins, verse 1, in, in, in Acts 2 and verse 20, excuse me, Acts 4, and verse 25. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And yet I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So as these men lift their voice up to God in unison, they quote the first couple of verses of Psalm 2 and make application of that, that psalm to the opposition that they face. And we're going to look at that in the next two verses. This verse and the next verse. We're going to look at those who would oppose them and why. The kings of the earth. We, we use different terminology nowadays, don't we? We're talking about folks in authority. We're talking about uh, magistrates. We're talking about governors, governments. We're talking about individuals in these high places, individuals that exercise rule or dominion. Now, we're going to look at a few, and then next week we're going to look at three of these same, and we're going to, we're going to look at one more in, in a more generic sense. But we understood that they faced opposition. Now, when we, when we think of the two main enemies of the church in the first century, what do we think of? Well, we think, number one, of Jews, their own countrymen. Who, do we, who else do we think of? Rome. Rightfully so. Those are two of these that we're going to look at. But we're going to look at the Jewish authority. So if you will, go to Acts 5. And beginning in verse 21, let's look at an example of opposition of the church by these Jewish authorities. <clears throat> it says, And when they had heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came. And they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent them to prison to have them brought. And when the officers came and found them not in prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you've put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people. 
lest they should have been stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. He's getting them, isn't he? The Jews are getting on these guys. <clears throat> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. What's new? What's new? You reckon Noah faced any opposition in his day? We talked about that a little bit this morning. Do you think folks were like, what are you doing, Noah? Do you know where Noah was, roughly? We got a pretty decent idea of where Noah was, roughly speaking. Guess, wasn't, guess what wasn't very close? A very big bodily, body of water. Why are you building this big boat, Noah? What are you doing? Are you crazy? Oh, well, there's a cataclysm coming. It's going to rain for 40 days, 40 nights, man. I'm telling you, it's going to be bad. Everybody's going to be swept away. God says he will end all life. What are you talking about? You reckon he faced any opposition? Do you think that God's people have not always faced some opposition and some difficulties, as Brother Jerry mentioned in his prayer? You reckon we'll face any? Do you face any today? You know, difficulties don't always come in the form of, of harassment or persecution. There are other things at work as well. There are just difficulties in life in general. We've always faced them. And we will always face them. So the Jewish authorities are an example of these kings, these rulers that set themselves in opposition to God and His Christ. Rome. John 19 and verse 1. <clears throat> Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. We talked about that the other day. Psalm 129 and verse 3. The plowers plowed my back. We talked about that, didn't we? Brother Lee mentioned that this morning. They scourged him. They took this flagrum and they ripped his back to pieces. They beat him in such a violent manner as that often that kind of beating was in and of itself sufficient for death. Jesus lasted Somehow, Mark 14 says, Pilate marveled that Jesus was so soon dead. No wonder he was dead so soon. They ripped him to pieces. John 19, 2, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns. Brother Lee talked about that also. You know, I did a little looking at that myself some years back. And there was a tree that some folks think that this came from. And it was called the lote tree. And they said these, inches, these, crown, these thorns were anywhere from an inch to two inches. And they said that it wasn't so much of a crown as it was a headpiece that they jammed on his head. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine these thorns? You ever, you ever run up on a, a, a briar or run up on a, a one of those, those thorns or those vines that have those really long thorns out in the woods? You run up on it one time and it gets your attention pretty quick. What if you had a whole bunch of them jammed on your head then they hit you with a, with a rod? How would you think you'd feel? Who's doing this to Jesus? Rome. We know who was behind it. We know that the Jews ultimately bear the sin of crucifying Christ. But they persuaded Pilate and therefore Rome, the authorities, to do so. There was Roman opposition to truth. As long as Rome stood. Why do you think that is? Because what Rome allowed, God forbade. What Rome taught, God taught otherwise. Well, what's new? What happens today? Uh, our, our children go into school and they're taught evolution. Guess what? Evolution is contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Somebody's wrong. Little kids are taught today that it's okay for uh, a boy and a boy to be married. It's okay for a woman and a woman. It's okay for a boy to think he's a girl or vice versa. They're taught these things. That there's, there's some things that are just wrong and there are some things that are just right. And when what man teaches conflicts with what God said, man's wrong. But there will always be opposition. These governments, they will always be in opposition to truth because truth is exclusive. Mm -hmm. All right? So the, the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they put him on a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And if that wasn't enough, they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know I find no fault in him. Then came 
Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and, uh, robe, and Pilate said unto him, Behold the man, John 19, 6. When the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him. Who said that? The Jews. The chief priests. Pilate said unto them, Take you him. You do it. We won't. Rome won't do it. If you want him crucified, you do it. But they convince him, don't they? Then the Jews said, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself God. Reference Exodus 20, that is uh, blasphemy, that is making one equal with God. John 19, 8, Then Pilate therefore heard that saying, He was more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate says unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? Or power to release thee? And Jesus would tell him, You have no power at all but that which was given you. The kings of the earth array themselves in opposition to God and his Christ. The Jews did it. Rome did it. What about Herod? Mark chapter 6. Was there any opposition to truth by Herod? Let me, let me read something for you. Mark 6, beginning in verse number 21. Now when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, his high captains, and the chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of said Herodias came in, that was Herod's brother's Philip, his wife, by the way, and danced. What's wrong with a little dancing? You mean lasciviousness? What's wrong with a little lasciviousness? Oh, a little dancing never hurt anything. Really? A little alcohol never hurt anything. Really? Where would the world be without alcohol? In a better place, there'd be a lot of families not broken up, don't you think? Where would the world be without lasciviousness? We'd be in a lot better shape right now, wouldn't we? Oh, what harm's ever come from dancing? Ask yourself that honestly, please. Oh, it's okay for my daughter to go to the prom and to gyrate and to, to be all over some other guy. That's perfectly fine. Have you lost your mind? In what world could that possibly be perfectly fine? We are not to be licentious. We're not to be lascivious. We are not to involve ourselves in those kind of activities because those, act have, uh, those kind of activities very often lead to other activities that we should have nothing to do with. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure this out, do you? And when Herodias, the, uh, when, when she came in and did what now? Why was Herod so enthralled with Herodias' daughter? Well, she, I wonder if this was, you know, just a, she had on a very modest outfit and it was a line dance. Anybody think it was a line dance? You think they did the electric slide? You, you reckon that's what that was? Chris knows about the electric slide. I don't think that's what it was. She was obviously dancing, you know, she was dancing and probably dressed very provocatively. Because she had Herod wrapped around her finger by what now? Just by dancing. When folks appeal to that fleshly appetite, that's tough, isn't it? That's powerful. That's strong. It pleased Herod and them that sat with him. And the king said unto the damsel, You ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And he swear unto her. What did he say? Whatsoever thou shalt ask, I will give unto the half of my kingdom. I'll give you anything. Because I'm so happy with how you made me feel. So she goes to Mama and asks. And Mama wants the head of John the Baptist. Verse 25. And she came in straightway and made haste to the king. And asked saying I will that thou give me by and by in a charger. The head of John Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake. He would not reject her. Listen. If you make a promise to somebody before you realize something is wrong, break that promise. I'll say that again. If you promise to hurt someone, to do something wrong, if you promise to do something sinful, and then you realize it would be wrong to do so, don't do it. If you disagree with that, please let me know back there and I'll let, we'll, we'll discuss it. Question, would it have been right or wrong for Herod to break his promise there under these circumstances? Right or wrong? You can't possibly argue that it's okay not to break a promise if that involves sin. You made a mistake. Hey, look, I didn't realize what I was promising. I've changed my view since then. I can't do that. I'm sorry. I just, I can't. Forgive me, please. 
but I, I can't do it. That would have been right for Herod to do, but what did he do? For his oath's sake, he didn't reject it. What did he do? He killed a prophet. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison. And he gave it to the damsel and a charger. Why? What was the reason? John told Herod he could not have his brother's wife. Well, hey man, I don't know what gospel you're talking about, but the God I know wants us to be happy. And if, and if your sister-in-law makes you happy, you should just, you just go on and marry her. Huh? What kind of terrible advice is that? That's the world we live in, isn't it? If it feels good, do it. If you want it, take it. Right? That, that's, we're, we're barbarians, aren't we? The more advanced we get, the further we digress. There are rules that we are supposed to live by. Proverbs 8, excuse me, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The kings of the earth, they assembled or united against who? Against the Lord. This is speaking of the Father because we have a direct reference also to His Christ, right? We know that. Matthew 4, 7, this is the Father. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25, this is the Father. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, this is the Father. Acts 4 and verse 24, this is the Father. Remember, just because the word Lord is there doesn't automatically mean Jesus. It also can mean, contextually, God the Father. Now when it says His Christ, that is exclusively speaking of who? Jesus. Christos, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that is David, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom you've crucified, what? Both Lord and anointed one, Christ. We're talking about Jesus. I'd like to close with 1 Corinthians 15. And I'd like to make this point. And I made it earlier. And we're going back to that. As long as the kingdom of God stands, there will be opposition. Our AD 70 brethren have taught that the end came with the coming of Titus and the sacking of Jerusalem. These brethren have taught that 1 Corinthians 15 was fulfilled. These brethren have taught that all opposition has been taken away. And in a debate it was pointed out to them, if we can show that there has been one enemy of Jesus since AD 70, we show that they're wrong. Question, has there been one enemy of God since AD 70? What about Hitler? Stalin? What about uh, these guys? Uh, what about that one uh, uh, little uh, communist guy that they like to wear on their shirt? All the kids think it's cute. What about all these guys that have murdered innocents and millions of them? Have, has that been an opposition to truth? What about the glaring elephant in the room? What about death? If all enemies have been put down, then death has been put down. And if death has been put down, then it's either physical or spiritual. It can't be physical because we still what? Die. Therefore, according to them, it must be spiritual, which means what? We're all saved anyway. Universalism. Hello. Listen to what Paul would say. There will be opposition to Jesus and his kingdom as long as the earth stands. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. That doesn't mean that Jesus relinquishes power. That means that he puts opposition under his feet. He conquers. Contextually, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So understand that last phrase, put down rule and authority and power. When I read that first, I thought, oh, that means that he'll, he'll subject himself to Jesus. He'll give that power up. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about him subjecting others. It is talking about bringing things under his feet. That is, uh, putting enemies down. Verse 25. Verse 26 gives us even more information. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what now? Death. Obviously, we're not talking about spiritual death. Well, it would be a result of that. We're talking about the end will come. There will be no more physical, and we will either be in heaven or hell, and therefore there will be no more death, period. 
For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he shall, uh, when, when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, he being the Father, is accepted, which did put all things under him, him being Jesus. And all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall he, uh, the Son also himself be subject unto them that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The kingdom of God will face opposition as long as the earth stands. When the earth ends, when time ends, when the universe ends, that will be destroyed, death will be conquered, and we will be in, in eternity, either in heaven or hell, right? That, that's the only two. And those in hell will be suffering eternal death for ever and ever and ever. Death being what? Separation, James 2.26. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time for any that have never obeyed the gospel. You must hear the word of God and believe it. Repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith in Christ, be baptized for the remission of sins. Those who have obeyed the gospel, we must uh, uh, remain faithful. And if you are not faithful, make things right. Repent. Ask God to forgive you. He will. Ask for encouragement or strength. Read and study. Build yourself up through God's inspired word and overcome the difficulties that we face. Uh, if you have any need with that, please let us know. And we would offer prayers on your behalf. Please come now as we stand and sing.